Lord Jesus. Hello again, and welcome to Man's Talk. I'm Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. And thank you for tuning in. Um, hopefully next week, we could do it this week, but I wasn't prepared. I think next week, Carla and I will go back in the studio. Um, unfortunately, I don't think Republic will be open for us to go and have coffee. I don't think they have enough outdoor space, but maybe, you know, so I'm going to give you my two cents on, not on whether or not restaurants should or shouldn't be able to serve, blah, blah, because I, I don't know. And I, you know, I feel like I'm batting my head against the wall. I know that must be how you feel because I know this is bothering you more than it is bothering me just because I keep ignoring it. I've got like this tinfoil, um, I can't do it mental hat on. But I was thinking about the restaurants downtown. So whether we like it or not, if there's a, if the restaurants are able to open with outdoor seating, right? That's great for places like Murphy's or the Crown or the farm that have outdoor patios. But it does kind of stink for places like Mint Bistro or Republic or Pecola where they don't have outdoor space. So what if we, um, what if Manchester loosened the restrictions on outdoor space and allowed those restaurants not only to use their entire sidewalks, but perhaps even um, the parking spots in front of their businesses for the time being. Maybe we just don't have parking on Elm Street for a while or on different streets where there's restaurants so that those restaurants can take advantage of that outdoor space and have some, and be able to start their businesses back. Right? Like, let, uh, is anybody in the city government thinking about the businesses and how they can help them? Or are no, we just the city government is 100% not thinking about the businesses and how they can help them because, you know, they've now decided that they can pick winners or losers. They're going to tell you who can cut your hair when they're telling you when, you know, and that basically is the problem with all of this. Tammy and I were talking before the show started, so she knows my frustration level yeah. has, you know, peaked and it's just I, 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 think that, I don't, don't want to get into it because I am at this stage where I'm just like you know what they did it wrong they did it wrong from the start there's nothing they're going to do that's going to make anyone happy I hope that every single small business owner and taxpayer in this state actually just refuses to pay their taxes that's what I hope if I seem distracted at any point during the show, it's because there's a tree guy that was supposed to be working on ropes while we're doing this, and I see a saw moving, so I just might, <laughs> it might catch my attention. Um, I do want to bring in Victoria Sullivan. She was comment, she did a little Facebook Live thing this morning about um, school spending, and I thought, you know, we haven't talked to Victoria in a while, so I am going to add her to the mix, and she should pop up any moment now. Um, that's Victoria. Hello. Hi, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? I can hear you too. Um, how Hello. are you? I'm frustrated. How are you? <laughs> I know. You and Carla can both be frustrated. I'm frustrated too, but I have like this mental um, aluminum hat that I keep wearing that is just focused on gardening and sewing and cooking because I just don't have the space in my brain right now to be that frustrated. Yeah, we've been doing yard work um, and cleaning, but you know, once you clean, there's nowhere for you to put the trash. Cause... Right. Well, so I wanted to bring you in because I know you had some thoughts about um, school spending and whatnot, but Carla and I had been chatting. So before we started the show today, I went out to drive by um, the Amoskeg Bridge homeless camp facility, campground, don't know what to call it. And from what I could see, there were at least 17 tents. And we are talking, some of these tents are those big three, four room tents, um, four porta potties, whole little encampment. We're not talking about a couple random, I mean, the upside is they're no longer on, near the Granite Street stretch, although there is still a, a, a commode there that apparently somebody left behind. Um, and Carla, you were saying when you were walking along the Piscataquag Trail that there was a lot of um, homeless tents and whatnot. So I'm curious about that. Yeah, so I went out on Saturday, I think, or Sunday, maybe, whenever the weather was nice. Um, and oh. I walked the Piscataway River. So I parked, you know, near the, the, not at the ice arena, but the one on Electric Street, and then walked from there. And you can go over the pedestrian bridge to Gosstown. 
but I do the big loop. So I go on, on, you know, sort of parts of the trail that are a little more off the beaten track, but frankly, that whole area is, is well used, well loved. Um, a lot of us who live in the neighborhood and pay property taxes, um, you know, we, we go there and it's great because you can take your pets and whatever. So in the past, I would say months, we have seen a development of several tent cities. Uh, and, you know, to be fair, when I say a tent city, I mean more than one tent. Uh, so when I was out, uh, you know, I'm at the stage where I'm now carrying my gun again because, you know, you're in the woods and you don't really know who's about and what's happening. There is an incredible amount of trash. And so I had made a decision with myself. I was like, you know, when I go out there, if I see people, I'm going to engage them. I want to talk to them. I want to understand why they're there and maybe what we can do. Like, how do we solve these problems, right? So the one guy... Uh, you know, uh, mid fifties looks like probably uh, has a alcoholic a drinking problem. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. just speculating, right? But he's right down on, you know, the nice beach area where you know we would usually kind of go put your feet in the water, whatever. When you say the right beach there, area, do you mean right there on Electric Street? So you know where the pedestrian bridge goes over to the sports field, so to your side, to Barney's yes. side. Oh, so that beach. Okay. Yeah, so so oh. not on not so not the the main main one, but there's a little one just oh. on the other side of it. So right there, like in the water, where where to be honest, where my blue crane usually lives, which I haven't seen this season because now there's people you know down there sunning themselves like walruses on on the <laughs> banks of of the Piscataqua River. Okay, fine. So that guy I didn't talk to, but I was annoyed and he didn't even really seem conscious that there were people around or you know didn't that, there was trash or was whatever but then as i walked up towards the uh the hydroelectric park um i ran into another quite a large tent um a large camp it had been macheted trees have been taken down there's like a little you know area and i could see the the, the young man through the tent flap and so I stopped and I was like, hey, hi, dude, <laughs> you know, we introduced ourselves, we talked for a while, you know, his story was he lost his job, then he lost his apartment, then he got uh, injured somehow. He's hoping that he and his wife, uh, she was in the tent, but I didn't see her, you know, he, he thinks he, they'll be out of there in the next month. We talked a little bit about things like abulation, like where are you pooping? Because, you know, if my dog is off leash, do my dog happens to like that kind of stuff. So it becomes a problem, right? You can't just walk or enjoy the things that once again, as a property taxpayer, I am, you know, paying for these public spaces. Um, so that guy, you know, he was very conscious. We had a, we had a, uh, um, I think a respectful conversation. He definitely understands like he doesn't really want to be there. Um, and that he's hoping he can get back on his feet. As I was coming back, um, I ran into a property owner who lives down there who has a large piece of property. He actually used to own everything, including on the sports fields on the other side of the river. Uh, his property 30 years ago got taken by eminent domain by the EPA to put in this public park that we are now all supposed to be able to enjoy. He had some choice words about the situation down by the river, including that he puts a posted sign saying this part is public property or, or private property. So in talking to him, it was very um, interesting, right? So he's, his position is this is my private property. I don't want them intense on my property. Fair and enough. they are intense on his property. So he's upset about that. I fully get that part, right? As private property owners, you should be able to say you can't be on my land, right? But he's also like, he doesn't really want to call the cops. So now he has to, you know, go down there by himself. He's, he's elderly. His wife doesn't like the idea that he's down there trying to confront these people, you know, and he's just kind of like, well, can they at least get off my property? But then me, as someone who uses the park, I'm like, that's great. Now they're off his property, but now they're on the public property. And now we just have this problem. And then on top of that, in Joyce Craig's entire wisdom, has decided to create this homeless camp under the Amiskeg Bridge, which, you know, is just... I, 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 uh, I don't. I mean, I don't even know what to say at this stage. That's Craigville. She's created Craigville. Remember Hooverville? Well, now we've got Craigville. And I the mean, situation it, with the homeless, 
Oh, Carla, we should have had coffee because I just did a whole Facebook Live about how frustrated I am by everything in the city. And my poor dog was in my lap trying to calm me down because I was like so upset. But this homeless situation was something we discussed last summer over right. and over again. And just like you said, I was down the trails talking to people, in the parks talking to people. And it's not one homeless crisis, right? You've got people that are suffering from addiction. You've people that have alcohol addiction, drug addiction, mental illness, people like the gentleman that you spoke with, they're just in between places. And we're going to have a lot more of those people by the end of this situation. And instead of addressing that, she had a task force that from what I can tell did nothing. Um, she hired another employee that from what I can tell did nothing. And instead of addressing this situation last year, it was never addressed appropriately businesses to start off so here's it's affecting property owners but last summer we were talking to business owners that were down three percent for the year so far because of the homeless situation downtown so then they come into the, now that was by the summer i yeah. imagine by the winter it was down even more right well, so then well, yeah and then they were like hey let's just shut down your businesses for months on end right? you know that'll help as well businesses, right but those businesses that were already struggling had had the downtown situation been corrected and they those businesses would have been in a stronger position going into something like this so they're actually behind a lot of other cities as far as businesses go because they were already behind right so Portsmouth's a great business last summer yeah. they have a great city they know how to do things Manchester was already struggling before this happened so yeah the whole and the homeless situation is it is everywhere now like I've got people up in the north end calling me because they have camps on the river in the north end and they're very close to their families so we don't know if these people have COVID we don't know if they have typhoid and there are strains of hepatitis that also go through these camps that we know of right there I live on the south side and the trails by Shaw's there's people living there they're, they're everywhere and now she's made a statement that this is temporary but what's going to be the end of the temporary? I mean, oh. that, what, what's the trigger point to remove the porta potties that these people are very much now going to be accustomed to having? And Tammy, what? Where are they going to go? I mean, she right. couldn't handle this situation when it was much smaller. Now, with porta potties, washing stations, free tents, and three hot meals a day, which they're being given, right? They don't have to go anywhere. They're right there, and there's you know, there's a fence around them and police protection 24 seven or and they uh, I drove by and so now you've got tents within this fenced area but now they've got tarps attached to the fence I mean so we've we're making it more comfortable I you know I and I, I I've never been homeless I can't wrap my head around it but yeah. I can't imagine that all of those people all of them are there because it, I mean some people just choose not to live someplace. That's just the reality. I, don't, I know it sounds harsh, but some people just choose not to live indoors. But that doesn't mean you can live wherever you want. Well, there are people doing Facebook Lives. <laughs> They've got phones and they're in the camps doing Facebook Lives, asking for people to bring them things and stating that they came there from other towns right. because they were being given all this stuff. So she could not, she the mayor, could not manage this this situation before this. Now it has exploded. And she says it's temporary. Where are all these people going to go when it's no longer temporary? They well, do you know, not have a way to take care of this. If situation. the purpose of opening these camps was because, I mean, I guess I can understand the, the problem with the shelters. If, if you aren't sick and you know that there's um, an outbreak in the shelter, for instance, you wouldn't want to go to the shelter. That makes sense. I get that. But, you know, I was trying to think, like, so where where could people go if they literally do not have a home and they can't go to the shelter because they fear that they're going to get the virus from the shelter? And if you've ever been to that shelter, I, I talked about it last year when I went to go visit it. It is not clean on the best of days. Like, right. they do not take care of it. It's well, a... Didn't we, didn't we set up hundreds and hundreds of beds in the SNU arena for the, the hospital overflow? Couldn't that be a short-term fix? We have a, the former police station still sits vacant. I mean, people lived in there for a while. Maybe we could just open that up and let people live in there. At least there's bathrooms in there. Um, it just seems like encouraging an outdoor tenting facility 
for the sake of protecting people from catching a virus in the shelter is creating a long-term problem that I don't I mean, see how they're going to get rid of. No. I will be very, very surprised if we get rid of, I, I think people, Manchkins should just get used to the idea that there will now be a permanent homeless camp under the Emmeskeg well, Bridge I'm in Manchester, New Hampshire, because I don't see how, like, once you do this, now you're creating sort of like these soft rights, and, you know, and I, I work happily with the ACLU on a lot of stuff, but, you know, I, I disagree with them on what I think public and private property is. Um, I don't see why it has to be this eyesore in the middle of, of downtown areas. I mean, if we have to give these public services, can we do it on a farm outside the right. city and just give the people services out there? <laughs> I, do, I, I really genuinely, I'm like, and so, you know, I'm so, so, so everyone's being accommodated except yeah. the people who pay the bills. And, yeah. and I don't think that's acceptable. And no one should be given anything. I'm sorry. That if we are going to set up some place for people to live, they need to work. They need to work to keep it clean. These places are not, there is no respect for the, the people or the property around them. And I know that there are some good people down there that are just in a bad way and they're stuck in these circumstances. But because you live outside and you're homeless does not mean that you get to trash the place that you're That's at. Right. They, some of these people were offered hotel rooms and they trashed them so they're not allowed back in. So to answer your question, Tammy, who wants to give up their property and help people that don't respect that help? We need to instill a work ethic in these people. Like, like for the homeless shelter, if you're using that service, you have a job there. You're cleaning the stairs, you're cleaning the bathrooms, you're helping with food service. You're doing something because without a purpose in life people are not ever going to step up and giving handouts is not a way to help any of these people okay uh, you can see where and, i'm at and, i mean we know <laughs> out of basic basic economics right like all three of us understand the concept whatever you subsidize you get more of and this was something that tammy and i talked about and actually victoria when you were running for office last year and i genuinely wish you had won <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, maybe you're happy you didn't because we couldn't have predicted all of this, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's worse I think we could have been a different city under this. Honestly, if I had won and if we had elected certain people to the boards that, that would have been helpful too, um, I think that we would be in a much, we definitely would have been more transparency. I would have been the kind of mayor that is out there talking to the people or available to the people all the time. I wouldn't have disappeared like she does. I do a Facebook live every day because Tammy actually recommended it because I was doing them. And she's like, why don't you do this every day to stay connected to people? And you know, I got to a point where I'm like, people must be tired of hearing from me. No. And then I get messages from people that I don't even know that say, can you please keep going? Because it makes me feel connected. It makes me feel like someone's listening. It makes me feel like there's some kind of normalcy. So that's what you have to do as a leader is be there for your freaking people. And she's not. And there is there is no leadership in this city right now. Every department is doing what they want to do. There's there's no one steering the ship. So what kills well, me well, is not okay, only so no one steering the ship. I mean, we haven't seen one, not one, not one employee of the city or the state has been furloughed or declared non-essential. Not only that, everyone is getting buco buco bonuses and more and more money. It's and you know, if we look at how all of this shakes out, someone's getting royally screwed. I think I'm allowed to say that. And it's, it's the, the responsible people. And I think we need to say enough is enough. And we need to yeah. elect the right people who can actually solve these problems. Well, yeah. what were you school saying board, this about the school budget, Victoria? Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's where I was going. So our enrollment is declining 14%. And I'm going to do a hat tip to John DePietro because he did the numbers. I find it very frustrating watching these meetings when I'm you know sitting on a couch and I can't actually be a participant in them. And you know, public comment is... Not, not allowed. Um, so John DePietro did the numbers last night. We're expecting a 14% decline in enrollment. I think the numbers are going to be higher just based on my conversations with people who are not going to send their kids back to school now that they've seen Good. the curriculum, now that they know what they can actually do as a parent to help their child and with so many online resources. I think that we're going to see more of a decline in enrollment. They want to increase the school district budget 
by 15%. No other business does that because they know that it puts them under, they can't function that way. So for, I'm, I'm completely disappointed in the superintendent. He's not, well, I mean, when he, we interviewed him, I thought, I think he's gonna be okay, but I did have some red flags go up when I spoke to him personally, like he'd get a great speech. But when I spoke with him one-on-one, -on -one, I was like, I'm not sure if he's actually the person he's presenting himself to be. And now I'm starting to see that he, he just wasn't, he's, he's, so far not a strong leader and not good for our city and their school board is not representing the people at all they are not with between the teachers contract that got snuck in at the beginning of all this crisis to the 15 percent increase when people don't know how they're going to feed their families they're not going to be able to pay property taxes we have businesses who will be paying taxes what is meals and room tax going to look like for this city yeah. she has oh. acknowledged a deficit and then she's going to increase spending well, that, and not only that, they're going to, uh, small business owners and business taxes are slated to go up by 12%. I know. Because they negotiated a terrible bill that said that, you know, if we don't make X amount in tax, then we're going to punish the people even more. So and the governor is trying to, the governor is trying to swap that away so it doesn't actually go into effect, but look at what the Democrats have done during this cycle. And I, I hate to be partisan about it because it takes all of us to fix a problem, but under these circumstances, I will say, um, whether you agree with the steps the governor has taken or not, he has been transparent, he's been out there for the people, he's been talking to people. But the Democrats have tried to up, hold up the federal funds that are coming back to this state by the taxpayers of this state, right? Tried to hold them up He's, they've sued the governor twice. They're in the second lawsuit with him. He had $26 million that was coming to Health and Human Services to help with the homeless situation, to help with people with addiction, to help grandparents who are now homeschooling or, or remote schooling their children, their grandchildren. And they are trying to hold up that money. So these political games that are happening are absolutely unacceptable under these circumstances and if we don't start pushing these party lines apart during a situation like this to help everybody we not only is the city in trouble but the state is in trouble oh the state is already in trouble i mean i, I quite frankly i don't think i mean i don't think america is going to be the same but i 100 percent don't think New Hampshire is going to be the same. I mean, we, we, we basically decided we're some backyard to Massachusetts and nothing that makes the New Hampshire advantage the New Hampshire advantage, which is, you know, res personal responsibility, taking care of your own business, making sure you're taking care of yours so that you don't have to be a burden on someone else and being like responsible, decent human beings like that's just all gone out the window now it's just a free-for-all i mean everyone's just trying to get their money uh, you know their hands on that 1.25 billion dollars and you know and we can see where they're they're paying for votes and you can see it with you know an extra 300 dollars per week here and there and there and there and where is the relief for all of us no we're just expected to suddenly accept that we have to be surrounded by like homeless camps and danger and all of that, and we should just keep on paying. Well, you know what? No thing. Yeah, but the, the homeless camps, that was a, that was the, so the alderman, just so people know, the alderman did not have a say in any of those camps. This all went, the mayor went to health and human services at the state level, got the money and set it up. They were not, they did not know what was happening. They did not have a say in what was happening. And they were just as surprised as everybody else. So that is not how government is supposed to work. Um, and as far as the rest of it goes, I, I know I know from conversations I'm having with business people and associations and people on the state level and legislators that some of the closings or the, the reopenings that aren't happening are not because the governor's trying to keep those closed. They have been at the request of the businesses. Well, and, well and that's because they know because of the, the benefit that's being paid and the moral hazard that was created by giving all these doles and benefits out to people. I understand everyone's trying to make a good situation better, but there are fundamentals like liberty <laughs> that actually if you adhere to that you will have a better outcome and because we decided that the nanny state knows all and they don't we see the knock-on effects so yeah these businesses i mean if i had a restaurant 
I wouldn't want it to run at 50% because one, your employees don't want to be there because they can make more money on the dole. And two, you can't actually make a profit then. I mean, it just doesn't make economic sense. And so what we're seeing is when you take away control and decision making from the person who needs to make the decision, you will just get bad and worse outcomes. And you know what, guys? It's going to be, it's going to get worse. Economically speaking, this is going to be at least based on the bailout numbers four times worse than the 2008 crisis which means four times the homeless under that bridge. You know, four times, these are people who are hurting and we have to figure out ways to help them, but what we're doing is not helping them. No, it's not, it's not helping them and setting them up for, for longer failure. So, come jump in, because I'm the one with the timer. So, my timer, which is only 27 minutes, which means we actually have a little longer, um, is saying we only have a minute. How crazy is that? Um, I do want to say, whether you agree with the governor or not, whether you agree with the opening, the closing, the partial opening, um, if you want to read about what guidelines have put, been put out there, or if you are interested in listening to any of the task force meetings or input from public session, things like that, um, all of that is out at nheconomy.com. Um, you can see who's on the task force, all of the governor's uh, orders up to the, you know, everything's there. So and that's some of the, and the recordings are there and some of the conversations were really surprising. It did surprise me that the businesses were asking him to. That's what I to thought too. I was, the cosmetologists in particular really, really surprised me because I would have thought everybody would want to get back to doing business and they, they're, that industry in particular seems very, very concerned. And I don't. I don't even know if it's 100% rational, but it was, it was like there was a concerted effort for, of the cosmetology um, organization to say they weren't ready, which is weird. I do have a, a, the woman who does my pedicures, um, nails techs weren't in the first phase. Hopefully they're in the second phase, you know, and she's thought it through, like, how can she, you know, do this? and meet these guidelines and it, it does take some time but i still think it, we have to we have to let businesses open and try to figure some of this out for themselves because yeah and i think it's going to be interesting um to see what happens with the restaurants i don't right. think people are going to be in a rush to go out honestly yep. i think a, i think outdoors i'll go eat outdoors easily but that's because i love being outdoors but not i was saying before we had you got you on the on the call here um I would like to see Manchester um, relax the restrictions on outdoor seating so that places like Mint or Republic or Pocola could have the entire sidewalk and, if they want to keep it clean, the parking spaces in front of their business. That's what, um, well, I don't know about the parking spaces, but the parking lots are going to be used. That was part of the executive order from the governor. Yeah. They, can use, they can use whatever spaces around their business. But I think they that still has to get permission from Manchester. I think they have to, Manchester has a say in it, and God only knows Joyce Craig's not going to do anything for the people of Manchester. Anyways, we have to wrap it up. Um, Thank it you for having snow, me on today. It might snow on Saturday. No, just sure. telling you. That's Flurries. not right. It's not That's right. right. Um, but otherwise, it's been nice. Get out there, rake your lawn, uh, take a walk, try not to look at the homeless camps. Um, and we'll be back next week, probably in studio. Um, that's all we have for this week. Thanks for tuning like in. Like your fireplace. It's very pretty. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.